Part 2 of On Television by Pierre Bordeaux Translated by Priscilla Parkhurst Ferguson Published in The New Press, 1998 Part 2 Invisible Structures and Their Effects To move beyond a description, however meticulous, of what happens in a television studio, in order to try and grasp the explanatory mechanisms of the journalistic practice, I have to introduce a somewhat technical term, the idea of the journalistic field. Journalism is a microcosm with its own laws, defined both by its position in the world at large and by the attractions and repulsions to which it is subject from other such microcosms. To say that it is an independent or autonomous, it has its own laws, is to say that what happens in it cannot be understood by looking only at external factors. That is why I did not want to explain what happens in journalism as a function of economic factors. What happens on TF1 cannot be explained simply by the fact that it is owned by the Bouygues Holding Company. Any explanation that didn't take this fact into account would obviously be inadequate. But an explanation based solely on it would be just as inadequate. More inadequate still, perhaps, precisely because it would seem adequate. This half-baked version of materialism associated with Marxism condemns, without shedding light anywhere, and ultimately explains nothing. Market Share and Competition To understand what goes on at TF1, you have to take into account everything that TF1 owes to its location in a universe of objective relations between the different competitive television networks. You also have to recognize that the form this competition takes is defined invisibly by unperceived power relations. That can be grasped through indicators like market share, the weight given to advertising, the collective capital of high-status journalists, and so on. In other words, not only are there interactions between these news media, between people who do or do not speak to each other, people who influence each other and read each other's work, everything on which I've touched up until now, there are also completely invisible power relations. These invisible power relations mean that in order to understand what goes on at TF1, or art, you have to take into account the totality of the objective power relations that structure the field. In the field of economic enterprises, for example, a very powerful company has the power to alter virtually the entire economic playing field by lowering its prices and setting up a sort of entry barrier. It can forestall the entry into the market of new enterprises. These effects are not necessarily deliberate or intended. TF1 transformed television simply by accumulating a set of specific powers that influence this universe and are translated into an increased share of the market. Neither the viewers nor the journalists are able to see the structure. Journalists see its effects, but they don't see the extent to which the relative weight of the institution for which they work weighs on them, on their place within it and their own ability to affect this same institution. To try and understand what journalists are able to do, you have to keep in mind a series of parameters. First, the relative position of the particular news medium, whether it's TF1 or Le Monde, and second, the positions occupied by journalists themselves within the space occupied by their respective newspapers or networks. A field is a structured social space, a field of forces, a force field. It contains people who dominate and others who are dominated. Constant, permanent relationships of inequality operate inside this space which, at the same time, becomes a space in which the various actors struggle for the transformation or preservation of the field. All the individuals in this universe bring to the competition all the relative power at their disposal. It is this power that defines their position in the field, and, as a result, their strategies. Economic competition between networks or newspapers for viewers, readers, or for market share takes place concretely in the form of a contest between journalists. This contest has its own specific stakes, the scoop, the exclusive, professional reputations, and so on. This kind of competition is neither experienced nor thought of as a struggle purely for economic gain. Even though it remains subject to pressures deriving from the position, the news medium itself occupies within a larger set of economic and symbolic power relations. Today, invisible but objective relations connect people and parties who may never meet, say, the very serious monthly Le Monde Diplomatique at one extreme and the TF1 television channel at the other.
Nevertheless, in everything these entities do, they are led, consciously or unconsciously, to take into account the same pressures and effects, because they belong to the same world. In other words, if I want to find out what one or another journalist is going to say or write, or will find obvious or unthinkable, normal or worthless, I have to know the position that journalist occupies in this space. I need to know as well the specific power of the news medium in question. This impact can be measured by indicators such as the economic weight it pulls, that is, its share of the market, but its symbolic weight also comes into play, and that is much more difficult to quantify. In fact, to be complete, the position of the national media field within the global media field would have to be taken into account. We'd also have to bring in the economic, technical, and especially the symbolic dominance of American television, which serves a good many journalists as both a model and a source of ideas, formulas, and tactics. To understand the structure better in its current form, it's a good idea to go back over how it was established. During the 1950s, in France, television was barely a factor in the journalistic field. Hardly anyone thought about TV. Television workers were doubly dominated, culturally and symbolically, in terms of prestige, because they were suspected of being dependent on the political powers that be, and economically, because they were dependent on government subsidies and therefore much less efficient and much less powerful than their autonomous private counterparts. With time, the process of Warren's detailed examination, this relationship was completely reversed, so that television now dominates the journalistic field, both economically and symbolically. The general crisis faced by newspapers today makes the domination particularly conspicuous. Some newspapers are simply folding, and others are forced to spend every minute worrying about their very survival, about getting their audience, or getting it back. The most threatened, at least in France, are the papers that used to specialize in human interest stories or sports. They simply don't have much to offer against television programming that focuses more and more on sports and human interest stories. Circumventing the rules set by serious journalism, which puts, or used to put, on the front page foreign affairs, politics, even political analysis, giving less replacement to human interest stories and sports. Of course, this description is a rough one. It would be necessary to go into much more detail to provide a social history of the evolving relationships between the different media, as opposed to histories of a single newspaper or other news medium, something that unfortunately doesn't exist. It's on this level of structural history that the most important things appear. What counts in a field is relative weight, relative impact. A newspaper can remain absolutely the same, not lose a single reader, and yet be profoundly altered because its relative importance in the field has changed. For example, a newspaper ceases to dominate the field when it loses the power to lay down the law. It can certainly be said that Le Monde used to lay down the law in France in the world of print journalism. A field already existed divided between the poles recognized by all historians of journalism, consisting of newspapers that give news, stories and events, and newspapers that give views, opinions and analysis. Between mass circulation newspapers such as François and newspapers with relatively small circulation that are nonetheless endowed with a semi-official authority, Le Monde was in a good position on both counts. It had a large enough circulation to draw advertisers, and it had enough symbolic capital to be an authority. It held both factors of power in the field simultaneously. Such newspapers of opinion and analysis appeared in France at the end of the 19th century, as a reaction to the mass circulation sensational press. Educated readers have always viewed the sensational papers with fear or distrust, or both. Television, the mass medium par excellence, is therefore unprecedented only in its scope. Here I'll make an aside. One of the great problems faced by sociologists is how to avoid falling into one or the other of two symmetrical illusions. On the one hand, there is a sense of something that has never been seen before. There are sociologists who love this business, and it's very much the thing, especially on television, to announce the appearance of incredible phenomena or revolutions. And on the other hand, mostly from conservative sociologists, there is the opposite, the way it always has been. There is nothing new under the sun, there will always be people on top and people on the bottom, the poor are always with us, and the rich too. The already great risk of falling into such traps is all the greater because historical comparison is extremely difficult, 
Comparisons can only be made from structure to structure, and there is always a chance that you will make a mistake and describe as extraordinary something that is totally banal, simply because you don't know any better. This is one of the things that can make journalists dangerous, since they're not always very educated. They marvel at things that aren't very marvelous, and don't marvel at things that are in fact extraordinary. History is indispensable to sociologists. Unfortunately, in a good many areas, especially for the history of the present, the available studies are inadequate. This is particularly true in the case of a new phenomena, such as journalism. Making everything ordinary To return to the problem of television's effects, it is true that the opposition between news and analysis existed before, but never with this intensity. You see here that I'm steering between never been seen before and the way it always has been. Television's power of diffusion means that it poses a terrible problem for the print media and for culture generally. Next to it, the mass circulation press that sent so many shutters up educated spines in earlier times doesn't seem like much at all. Raymond Williams argued that the entire romantic revolution in poetry was brought about by the horror that English writers felt at the beginnings of the mass circulation press. By virtue of its reach, and exceptional power, television produces effects which, though not without precedent, are completely original. For example, the evening news on French TV brings together more people than all the French newspaper together, morning and evening editions included. When the information supplied by a single news medium becomes a universal source of news, the resulting political and cultural effects are clear. Everybody knows the law. That, if a newspaper or other news vehicle wants to reach a broad public, it has to dispense with sharp edges and anything that might divide or exclude readers. Just think about Paris Match, or in the US, Life Magazine. It must attempt to be inoffensive, not to offend anyone. And it must never bring up problems, or if it does, only problems that don't pose any problem. People talk so much about the weather in day-to-day -day life because it's a subject that cannot cause trouble. Unless you're on vacation and talking with a farmer who needs rain, the weather is the absolutely ideal, soft subject. The farther a paper extends its circulation, the more it favors such topics that interest everybody. And don't raise problems. The object, news, is constructed in accordance with the perceptual categories of the receiver. The collective activity I've described works so well precisely because of this homogenization, which smooths over things, brings them into line, and depoliticizes them. And it works even though, strictly speaking, this activity is without a subject. That is, no one ever thought of or wished for it as such. This is something that is observed frequently in social life. Things happen that nobody wants, but seem somehow to have been willed. Herein lies the danger of simplistic criticism. It takes the place of the work necessary to understand phenomena such as the fact that, even though no one really wished in this way, and without any intervention on the part of the people actually paying for it, we end up with this very strange product, the TV news. It suits everybody because it confirms what they already know, and, above all, leaves their mental structures intact. There are revolutions, the ones we usually talk about, that aim at the material basis of a society. Take the nationalization of the church property after 1789, and then there are symbolic revolutions, affected by artists, scholars, or great religious, or sometimes, though less often, political prophets. These affect our mental structures, which means that they change the ways we see and think. Manet is an example. His painting upset the fundamental structure of all academic teaching of painting in the 19th century, the opposition between the contemporary and the traditional. If a vehicle as powerful as television were oriented even slightly toward this kind of symbolic revolution, I can assure you that everyone would be rushing to put a stop to it. But it turns out that without anyone having to ask television to work this way, the model of competition and the mechanisms outlined above ensure that television does nothing of the sort. It is perfectly adapted to the mental structure of its audience. I could point to television's moralizing teleton side, which needs to be analyzed from this perspective. Andre Gide used to say that worthy sentiments make bad literature, but worthy sentiments certainly make for good audience ratings.
The moralizing bent of television should make us wonder how cynical individuals are able to make such astoundingly conservative moralizing statements. Our news anchors, our talk show hosts, and our sports announcers have turned into two-bit spiritual guides, representatives of middle-class morality. They're always telling us what we should think about what they call social problems, such as violence in the inner city or in the schools. The same is true for art and literature, where the best known of the so-called literary programs serve the establishment and ever more obsequiously promote social conformity and market values. Journalists, we should really say the journalistic field, owe their importance in society to their de facto monopoly on the large-scale informational instruments of production and diffusion of information. Through these, they control the access of ordinary citizens, but also of other cultural producers, such as scholars, artists, and writers, to what is sometimes called public space, that is, the space of mass circulation. This is the monopoly that blocks the way whenever an individual or member of a group tries to get a given piece of news into broad circulation. Even though they occupy an inferior, dominated position in the fields of cultural production, journalists exercise a very particular form of domination, since they control the means of public expression. They control, in effect, public existence, one's ability to be recognized as a public figure obviously critical for politicians and certain intellectuals. This position means that at least the most important of these figures are treated with a respect that is often quite out of proportion with their intellectual merits. Moreover, they are able to use part of this power of consecration to their own benefit. Even the best-known journalists occupy positions of structural inferiority vis-a-vis -vis social categories such as intellectuals or politicians. And journalists want nothing so much as to be part of the intellectual crowd. No doubt. This structural inferiority goes a long way to explain their tendency towards anti-intellectualism. Nevertheless, they are able to dominate members of these superior categories on occasion. Above all, though, with their permanent access to public visibility, broad circulation, and mass diffusion an access that was completely unthinkable for any cultural producer until television came into the picture, these journalists can impose on the whole of society their vision of the world, their conception of problems, and their point of view. The objection can be raised that the world of journalism is divided, differentiated, and diversified, and as such can very well represent all opinions and points of view, or let them be expressed. It is true that to break through journalism's protective shield, you can, to a certain extent, and provided you possess a minimum of symbolic capital on your own, play journalists and media off against one another. Yet, it remains true that, like other fields, the journalistic field is based on a set of shared assumptions and beliefs, which reach beyond differences of position and opinion. These assumptions operate within a particular set of mental categories. They reside in a characteristic relationship to language, and are visible in everything implied by a formulation such as it's just made for television. These are what supplies the principle that determines what journalists select both within social reality and among symbolic productions as a whole. There is no discourse, scientific analysis, political manifesto, whatever, and no action, demonstration, strike that doesn't have to face this trial of journalistic selection in order to catch the public eye. The effect is censorship, which journalists practice without even being aware of it. They retain only the things capable of interesting them and keeping their attention, which means things that fit their categories and mental grid. And they reject as insignificant or remain indifferent to symbolic expressions that ought to reach the population as a whole. Another consequence, one more difficult to grasp, of television's increased relative power in the space of the means of diffusion and of the greater market pressures on this newly dominant medium shows up in the shift from a national cultural policy, which once worked through television, to a sort of spontanistic demagoguery. While this change affects television in particular, it has also contaminated supposedly serious newspapers. Witness a greater and greater space given over to letters to the editor and op-ed pieces. In the 1950s, television in France was openly cultural. It used its monopoly to influence virtually every product that laid claim to high cultural status. Documentaries, adaptations of the classics, cultural debates, and so forth. And to raise the taste of the general public. 
In the 1990s, because it must reach the largest audience possible, television is intent on exploiting and pandering to these same tastes. It does so by offering viewers what are essentially raw products, of which the paradigmatic program is the talk show with its slice of life. These lived experiences come across as unbuttoned exhibitions of often extreme behavior aimed at satisfying a kind of voyeurism and exhibitionism. TV game shows, which people are dying to get on, if only as a member of the studio audience, just to have a moment of visibility, are another example. That said, I don't share the nostalgia professed by some people for the paternalistic pedagogical television of the past, which I see as no less opposed to a truly democratic use of the means of mass circulation than populist spontaneism and demagogic capitulation to popular tastes. Struggles settled by audience ratings. So you have to look beyond appearances, beyond what happens in the studio, and even beyond the competition inside the journalistic field. To the extent that it decides the very form of on-screen interactions, one must understand the power relationship between the different news media. To understand why we continually see the same debates between the same journalists, we have to consider the position of the various media that these journalists represent and their position within those media. Similarly, both of these factors have to be kept in mind if we want to understand what a reporter for Le Monde can and cannot write. What are actually positional pressures are experienced as ethical interdictions or injunctions. That's not the practice at Le Monde, or that doesn't fit with Le Monde's culture, or again, that just isn't done here, and so on. All these experiences presented as ethical precepts translate the structure of the field through an individual who occupies a particular position in the space. Competitors within a given field often have polemical images of one another. They produce stereotypes about one another and insults as well. In the world of sports, for example, rugby players routinely refer to soccer players as armless wonders. These images are often strategies that take into account and make use of power relationships which they aim to transform or preserve. These days... Print journalists, in particular those who occupy a dominated position within this sphere, that is, those who write for lesser newspapers and are in lesser positions, are elaborating a discourse that is highly critical of television. In fact, these images themselves take a stand, which essentially gives expression to the position occupied by individuals who, with greater or lesser disclaimers, articulate the view in question. At the same time, these strategies aim to transform the position this individual occupies in the field. Today, the struggle over television is central to the journalistic milieu, and its centrality makes it very difficult to study. A much pseudo-scholarly discourse on television does no more than record what TV people say about TV. Journalists are all the more inclined to say that a sociologist is good when what he says is so close to what they think. Which means, and it's probably a good thing too, that you haven't a prayer of being popular with TV people if you try to tell the truth about television. That said, there are indicators that, relative to television, print journalism is in gradual retreat. Witness the increasing space given to TV listings in newspapers, or the great store set by journalists in having their stories picked up by television, as well as obviously being seen on television. Such visibility gives them greater status in their newspaper or journal. Any journalist who wants power or influence has to have a TV program. It is even possible for television journalists to get important positions in the printed press. This calls into question the specificity of writing, and, for that matter, the specificity of the entire profession. The fact that a television news anchor can become the editor of a newspaper or news magazine from one day to the next makes you wonder just what the specific competence required of a journalist might be. Then, there is the fact that television more and more defines what Americans call the agenda, the issues up for discussion, the subjects of the editorials, important problems to be covered. In the circular circulation of information, I've described television carries decisive weight. If the printed press should happen to raise an issue, a scandal or a debate, it becomes central only when television takes it up and gives it full orchestration, and thereby political impact. This dependence on television threatens the position of print journalists, and this too calls the specificity of the profession into question. Of course, all of this needs to be documented and verified. 
What I'm giving here is simultaneously a balance sheet based on a number of studies and a program for further research. These are very complicated matters, about which knowledge cannot really advance without significant empirical work. This doesn't prevent the practitioners of mediology, self-designated specialists in a science that doesn't exist, from drawing all sorts of preemptory conclusions about the state of media in the world today before any study has been conducted. But the most important point is that through the increased symbolic power of television overall, and among the competing kinds of television, the increased influence of the most cynical and most successful seekers, after anything sensational, spectacular, or extraordinary, a certain vision of the news comes to take over the whole of the journalistic field. Until recently, this conception of the news had been relegated to the tabloids specializing in sports and human interest stories. Similarly, a certain category of journalists recruited at great cost for their ability immediately to fulfill the expectations of the public that expects the least, journalists who are necessarily the most cynical, the most indifferent to any kind of structural analysis, and even more reluctant to engage in any inquiry that touches on politics, tends to impose on all journalists its values, its preferences, its ways of being and speaking, its human ideal. Pushed by competition for market share, television networks have greater and greater recourse to the tried and true formulas of tabloid journalism, with emphasis, when not the entire newscast, devoted to human interest stories, or sports. No matter what has happened in the world on a given day, more and more often the evening news begins with French soccer scores or another sporting event interrupting the regular news. Or it will highlight the most anecdotal, ritualized political event, visits of foreign heads of state, the president's trips abroad, and so on, or the natural disasters, accidents, fires, and the like. In short, the focus is on those things which are apt to arouse curiosity, but require no analysis, especially in the political sphere. As I've said, human interest stories create a political vacuum. They depoliticize and reduce what goes on in the world to the level of anecdote or scandal. This can occur on a national or international scale, especially with film stars or members of royal families, and is accomplished by fixing and keeping attention fixed on events without political consequences, but which are nonetheless dramatized so as to draw a lesson, or be transformed into illustrations of social problems. This is where our TV philosophers are called in to give meaning to the meaningless, anecdotal or fortuitous event that has been artificially brought to stage center and given significance. A headscarf worn to school, an assault on a school teacher, or any other social fact tailor-made to arouse the pathos and indignation of some commentators or the tedious moralizing of others. This same search for sensational news, and hence market success, can also lead to the selection of stories that give free reign to the unbridled constructions of demagoguery, whether spontaneous or intentional, or can stir up great excitement by catering to the most primitive drives and emotions, with stories of kidnapped children and scandals likely to arouse public indignation. Purely sentimental and therapeutic forms of mobilizing feelings can come into play, but, with murders of children or incidents tied to stigmatized groups, other forms of mobilization can also take place. Forms that are just as emotional but aggressive enough almost to qualify a symbolic lynching. It follows that. The printed press today faces a choice. Should it go in the direction of the dominant model, which means publishing newspapers that resemble TV news? Or should it emphasize its difference and engage instead in a strategy of product differentiation? Should it compete and run the risk of losing on both fronts, not reaching a mass public while losing the one that remains faithful to the strict definition of the cultural message? Or once again, should it stress its difference? The same problem exists inside the television field itself, which is, of course, a subfield within the larger journalistic field. From my observation so far, I think that unconsciously those in charge who are themselves victims of the audience ratings mindset don't really choose. It is regularly observed that major social decisions aren't made by anyone. Sociologists always disturb things because they force us to make conscious things that we'd rather leave unconscious. I think that the general trend is for old-style means of cultural production to lose their specificity and move on to a terrain where they can't win.
Thus, the cultural network Channel 7, now ART, moved from a policy of intransigent, even aggressive, esotericism to a more or less disreputable compromise with audience ratings. The result is programming that makes concessions to facile, popular programming during prime time and keeps the esoteric fair for late at night. Le Monde, like other serious newspapers throughout the world, currently faces the same choice. I think I've said enough to show the move from analysis of invisible structures, a bit like the force of gravity, things that nobody sees but have to be accepted for us to understand what's going on, to individual experience and how the invisible power relations are translated into personal conflicts and existential choices. The journalistic field has one distinguishing characteristic. It is much more dependent on external forces than the other fields of cultural production, such as mathematics, literature, law, science, and so on. It depends very directly on demand, since, and perhaps even more than the political field itself, it is subject to the decrees of the market and the opinion poll. The conflict of pure versus market can be seen in every field. In the theater, for example, it turns up in the opposition between big, popular shows and avant-garde theater, between Broadway musicals and off-Broadway experimental theater. In the media, it's the difference between TF1 and Le Monde. All reflect the same opposition between catering to a public that is more educated, on the one hand, less so on the other, with more students for the one, more businessmen for the other. But if this opposition is ubiquitous, it's particularly brutal in the journalistic field, where the market weighs particularly heavily. Its intensity is unprecedented and currently without equal. Furthermore, the journalistic field has no equivalent of the sort of imminent justice in the scientific world that censures those individuals who break certain rules and rewards those who abide by them with the esteem of their peers, as manifested most notably in citations and references. Where are the positive or negative sanctions for journalism? The only criticism consists of satirical spoofs such as that on the puppets. As for the rewards, there is little more than the possibility of having one story picked up, copied by another journalist, but this indicator is infrequent, not very visible, and ambiguous. The Power of Television The world of journalism in itself is a field, but one that is subject to great pressure from the economic field, via audience ratings. This very heteronymous field, which is structurally very strongly subordinated to market pressures, in turn applies pressure to all other fields. This structural, objective, anonymous, and invisible effect has nothing to do with what is visible, or with what television usually gets attacked for, namely, the direct intervention of one or another individual. It is not enough, it should not be enough, to attack the people in charge. For example, Karl Kraus, the great Viennese satirist early in this century, launched violent attacks on a man who was the equivalent of the editor of Le Nouvelle Observateur. He denounced the cultural conformism so destructive of culture and the complacency of minor or measly writers whom he saw as discrediting pacifist ideas by championing them hypocritically. As a general rule, critics are concerned with individuals. But when you do sociology, you learn that men and women are indeed responsible, but that what they can or cannot do is largely determined by the structure in which they are placed and by the positions they occupy within that structure. So, polemical attacks on this or that journalist, philosopher, or philosopher-journalist are not enough. Everyone has a favorite whipping boy, and I am no exception. Bernard-Henri Lévy has become something of a symbol of the writer-journalist and the philosopher-journalist, but no sociologist worthy of the name talks about Bernard-Henri Lévy. It is vital to understand that he is only a sort of structural epiphenomenon, and that, like an electron, he is the expression of a field. You can't understand anything if you don't understand the field that produces him and gives him his parcel of power. This understanding is important both to remove the analysis from the level of drama and to direct action rationally. I am in fact convinced, and this presentation on television bears witness to this conviction, that analyses like this can perhaps help to change things. Every science makes this claim. Auguste de Comte, the founder of sociologies, proclaimed that science leads to foresight, and foresight leads to action.
Social science has as much right to this aspiration as any other science. By describing a space such as journalism, infesting it from the beginning with drives, feelings, and emotions, emotions and drives that are glossed over by the work of analysis, sociologists can hope to have some effect. Increasing awareness of the mechanisms at work, for example, can help by offering measure of freedom to those manipulated by these mechanisms, whether they are journalists or viewers. Another aside, I think, or at least I hope, that if they really listen to what I'm saying, journalists who might initially feel attacked will feel that by spelling out things they know vaguely but don't really want to know too much about, I am giving them instruments of freedom with which to master the mechanisms I discuss. In fact, it might be possible to create alliances between news media that could cancel out certain of the structural effects of competition that are most pernicious, such as the race for the scoop. Some of these dangerous effects derive from the structural effects shaping the competition, which produces a sense of urgency and leads to the race for the scoop. This means that news which might prove dangerous to those who involved can be broadcast simply to beat out a competitor, with no thought given to the danger. To the extent that this is true, making these mechanisms conscious or explicit could lead to an arrangement that would neutralize competition. In a scenario somewhat like what sometimes happens now in extreme cases, as when children are kidnapped for example, one could imagine, or dream, that journalists might agree to forget about audience ratings for once and refuse to open their talk shows to political leaders known for and by their xenophobia. Further, they could agree not to broadcast what these characters say. This would be infinitely more effective than all the so-called refutations put together. All of this is utopian, and I know it, but to those who always tax the sociologists with determinism and pessimism, I will only say that if people became aware of them, conscious action aimed at controlling the structural mechanisms that engender moral failure would be possible. As we have seen, this world, characterized by a high degree of cynicism, has a lot of talk about morality. As a sociologist, I know that morality only works if it is supported by structures and mechanisms that give people an interest in morality. And for something like a moral anxiety to occur, that morality has to find support, reinforcement, and rewards in the structure. These rewards could also come from a public more enlightened and more aware of the manipulations to which it is subject. I think that all the fields of cultural production today are subject to structural pressure from the journalistic field, and not from any one journalist or network executive who are themselves subject to control by the field. This pressure exercises equivalent and systematic effects in every field. In other words, this journalistic field, which is more and more dominated by the market model, imposes its pressure more and more on other fields. Through pressure from audience ratings, economic forces weigh on television. And, through its effect on journalism, television weighs on newspapers and magazines, even the purest among them. The weight then falls on individual journalists, who, little by little, let themselves be drawn into television's orbit. In this way, through the weight exerted by the journalistic field, the economy weighs on all fields of cultural production. In a very interesting paper, in a special issue on journalism of Acte de la Recherche en Sciences Sociales, Remy Lenoir shows how, in the judicial world, a certain number of hard-hitting judges, not always the most respectable according to the norms internal to the judicial field, made use of television to change the power relations inside their field. Essentially, they short-circuited internal hierarchies. This might be fine in some cases, but it can also endanger a stage of collective rationality that is achieved only with difficulty. Or more precisely, it calls into question everything that has been acquired and guaranteed by the autonomy of a juridical world able to set its model of rationality against the intuitive senses of justice and juridical common sense, both of which often give into appearances or emotion. Whether expressing their vision and their own values, or claiming in all good faith to represent popular feeling, journalists can influence judges, sometimes very directly. This has led to talk of a veritable transfer of the power to judge. An equivalent could also be found in science, where, as shown in the scandals analyzed by Patrick Champagne, the demagogic model, precisely the model of audience ratings, takes precedence over that of internal criticism. All this may appear quite abstract, 
In each field, the university, history, whatever, there are those who dominate and those who are dominated according to the values internal to that field. A good historian is someone good historians call a good historian. The whole business is circular by definition, but heteronomy, the loss of autonomy through subjection to external forces, begins when someone who is not a mathematician intervenes to give an opinion about mathematics, or when someone who is not recognized as a historian, a historian who talks about history on television, for instance, gives an opinion about historians, and is listened to. With the authority conferred by television, Mr. Cavada tells you that Mr. X is the greatest French philosopher. Can you imagine a referendum or a debate between two parties chosen by a talk show host like Cavada settling an argument between two mathematicians, two biologists, or two physicists? But the media never fail to offer their verdicts. The weekly magazines love this sort of thing, summing up the decade, giving the hit parade of the in intellectuals of the year, the month, the week, the intellectuals who count, the ones on their way up or on their way down. Why does this tactic meet with such success? Because these instruments let you play the intellectual stock market. They are used by intellectuals who are the shareholders in this enterprise. Often small shareholders to be sure, but powerful in journalism or publishing, to increase the value of their shares. Encyclopedias and dictionaries of philosophers, of sociologists, or sociology of intellectuals, whatever, are and have always been instruments of power and consecration. One of the most common strategies is to include individuals who, according to the field-specific criteria, could or should be excluded, or to exclude others who could or should be included. Or again, to modify the structure of the judgments being rendered in this hit parade. You can put side by side, say, Claude Levi Strauss and Bernard Henri Levy, that is, someone whose value is indisputable and someone whose value is indisputably disputable. But newspapers intervene as well, posing problems that are then immediately taken up by journalist intellectuals. Anti intellectualism, which is, very understandably, a structural consonant in the world of journalism, pushes journalists periodically to impute errors to intellectuals or to initiate debates that will mobilize only other journalist intellectuals, and frequently often exist only to give these TV intellectuals their media existence. These external demands are very threatening. In the first place, they can deceive outsiders, who necessarily matter, at least to the extent that cultural producers need listeners, viewers, and readers who buy books, and, through sales, affect publishers, and so determine future possibilities of publication. Given the tendency of the media today to celebrate market products designed for the best seller lists, and their obliging accommodation to back-scratching between writer-journalists and journalist-writers, Young poets, novelists, sociologists, and historians who sell 300 copies of their books are going to have a harder and harder time getting published. I think that, paradoxically, sociology, and most particularly the sociology of intellectuals, has made its own contribution to the state of the French intellectual field today. Quite unintentionally, of course, sociology can, in fact, be used in two contrary modes. The first, cynical mode, uses knowledge of the laws of a given milieu to maximize the effect of one's strategies. The other, which can be called clinical, uses the knowledge of these laws or tendencies in order to challenge them. My conviction is that a certain number of cynics, the prophets of transgression, TV's fast thinkers, the historian journalists who edit encyclopedias or spout summaries of contemporary thought, deliberately use sociology, or what they think is sociology, to engineer coup d'etats within the intellectual field. You could say as much about the genuinely critical thought of Guy Debord, touted as a great thinker of the society of the spectacle. Today, Debord is used to vindicate a fake, cynical radicalism that ends up cancelling out his thought altogether. Collaboration But journalistic forces and manipulation can also act more subtly. Like the Trojan horse, they introduce heteronymous agents into autonomous worlds. Supported by external forces, these agents are accorded an authority they cannot get from their peers. These writers, for non-writers, or philosophers, for non-philosophers, and the like, have television value. 
a journalistic weight that is not commensurate with their particular weight in their particular world. It's a fact. In certain disciplines, media credentials are now taken more and more into account, even in the review committees of the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique. Any producer of a TV or radio program who invites a researcher onto a show gives that individual a form of recognition that, until quite recently, was taken as a sign of corruption or decline. Barely 30 years ago, Raymond Aaron was seen as deeply suspect in spite of his hardly debatable merits as a scholar, simply because he was associated with the media as a columnist for Le Figaro. Today, the power relationships between fields have changed to the extent that, more and more, external criteria of evaluation, appearing on Bernard Pivot's popular TV book show, being endorsed or profiled by the weekly news magazines, are more important than peer evaluation. This occurs even in the purest universe of the hard sciences. It would be more complicated for the social sciences because sociologists talk about the social world in which everyone has a stake and an interest, which means that people have their good and bad sociologists for reasons that have nothing to do with sociology. In the case of apparently more independent disciplines, such as history or anthropology, biology or physics, media mediation becomes more and more important to the degree that subsidies and grants may depend on a notoriety in which one is hard put to distinguish what is owed to media validation from what is due to peer evaluation. This may seem excessive. Unfortunately, however, I could give all kinds of examples of media intrusion, or rather, the intrusion of economic pressures as relayed by the media, even in the purest science. This is why the question of deciding whether or not to appear on television is absolutely central, and why I'd like the scientific community to think about it carefully. Such reflection could increase awareness of the mechanisms I have described, and perhaps could even lead to collective attempts to protect the autonomy crucial to scientific progress against the growing power of television. For the media to exert power on worlds such as science, the field in question must be complicitous. Sociology enables us to understand this complicity. Journalists often take great satisfaction in noting how eagerly academics rush into the arms of the media, soliciting book reviews and begging for invitations to talk shows, all the while protesting against the oblivion to which they are relegated. Listening to their stories, one comes to have real doubts about the subjective autonomy of writers, artists, and scholars. This dependence has to be put on record. Above all, we must attempt to understand its reasons, or its causes. In some sense, we are seeking to understand who collaborates. I use this word advisedly. A recent issue of the Acte de la Recherche en Sciences Sociales contained an article by Giselle Sapiro on the French literary field during the occupation. The goal of this fine analysis was not to say who was or who was not a collaborator, nor was it a retrospective settling of accounts. Rather, working from a certain number of variables, it attempted to understand why, at a given moment, writers chose one camp and not the other. In short, her analysis shows that the more people are recognized by their peers and are therefore rich in specific capital, the more likely they are to resist. Conversely, the more heteronymous they are in their literary practices, meaning drawn to market criteria, like Claude Farrer, a best-selling author of exotic novels at the time whose counterparts are easily found today, the more inclined they are to collaborate. But I have to explain better what autonomous means. A highly autonomous field, mathematics for example, is one in which producers' sole consumers are their competitors. That is, individuals who could have made the discovery in question. I dream of sociology becoming like this, but unfortunately, everyone wants to get in on the act. Everybody thinks they know what sociology is, and Alain Perefit thinks he has to give me sociology lessons. Well, why not, you may ask, since there are plenty of sociologists or historians only too happy to talk things over with him on television. Autonomy is achieved by constructing a sort of ivory tower inside of which people judge, criticize, and even fight each other, but with the appropriate weapons, properly scientific instruments, techniques, and methods. I happened to be on the radio one day with one of my colleagues in history. Right on the air, he says to me, My dear colleague, I redid your factor analysis as a method of statistic analysis for the managers. 
and I didn't get at all what you got. And I thought, terrific, finally here's someone who is really criticizing me. But it turned out that he'd use a different definition of management and had eliminated bank directors from the population under study. All that had to be done to bring us together was to restore the bank directors, a choice that entailed important theoretical and historical choices. The point is, true scientific agreement or disagreement requires a high degree of agreement about the basis for disagreement and about the means to decide the question. People are sometimes astonished to see on television that historians don't always agree with each other. They don't understand that very often these discussions bring together individuals who have nothing in common and who have no reason even to be talking with one another, somewhat as if you brought together in just a sort of encounter bad journalist love, an astronomer and an astrologist, a chemist and an alchemist, or a sociologist of religion and a religious cult leader. From the choices made by French writers under the occupation can be derived a more general law. The more a cultural producer is autonomous, rich in specific capital from a given field, and exclusively integrated into the restricted market in which the only audience is competitors, the greater the inclination to resist. Conversely, the more producers aim for the mass market, like some essayists, writer-journalists, and popular novelists, the more likely they are to collaborate with the powers that be, the state, church, or party, and today, journalism and television, and to yield their demands or their orders. This law also applies to the present. The objection will be raised that collaborating with the media is not at all the same thing as collaborating with the Nazis. That's true, of course, and obviously, I do not condemn out of hand every kind of collaboration with newspapers, radio, or television, but from the viewpoint of factors inclining the individual to collaboration, understood as unconditional submission to pressures destructive of the norms of autonomous fields, the analogy is striking. If the fields of science, politics, or literature are threatened by the power of the media, it's because of the presence within them of heteronymous individuals, people from the outside who have little authority from the viewpoint of the values specific to the field. To use the language of everyday life, these people are already, or are about to become, failures, which means that they have an interest in heteronomy. It is in their interest to look outside the field for their authority and the rewards, however precipitate, premature, and ephemeral, they did not get inside the field. Moreover, journalists think well of these individuals because they aren't afraid, as they are of more autonomous authors, of people who are ready to accept whatever is required of them. It seems to me indispensable to combat these heteronymous intellectuals. It's because they constitute the Trojan horse through which heteronomy, that is, the laws of the market and the economy, is brought into the field. The political field itself enjoys a certain autonomy. Parliament, for example, is an arena within which, in accordance with certain rules, debate, and votes, resolve disputes between individuals who supposedly articulate divergent or even antagonistic interests. Television produces in this field effects analogous to those it produces in other fields, the juridical field in particular. It challenges the rights of the field to autonomy. To show this mechanism at work, let us examine a story reported in the same issue of Acte de la Recherche en Sciences Sociales, on the power of journalism. The story of Corinne. Corinne is a little girl in the south of France who was murdered. The local newspapers reported all the facts, the indignant protests of her father and her uncle, who organized small local demonstrations which were carried first by one paper, then a whole string of papers. Everyone said, how awful, a little kid, we have to reinstate the death penalty. Local political leaders, people close to the National Front, got especially worked up. A conscientious journalist from Toulouse tried to issue a warning. Watch out, this is a lynching. Take your time, think about what you're doing. Lawyers groups got involved, denouncing the appeal to vigilante justice. Pressure mounted, and when things finally settled down, life imprisonment without parole had been reinstated. This film run fast forward shows clearly how a perverse form of direct democracy can come into play when the media act in a way that is calculated to mobilize the public. Such direct democracy maximizes the effect both of the pressures working upon the media and of collective emotion. The usual buffers, 
not necessarily democratic, against these pressures are linked to the relative autonomy of the political field. Absent this autonomy, we are left with a revenge model, precisely the model against which the judicial and even political model of justice was established in the first place. It happens on occasion that, unable to maintain the distance necessary for reflection, journalists end up acting like the fireman who sets the fire. They help create the event by focusing on a story, such as the murder of one young Frenchman by another young man, who is just as French but of African origin, and then denounce everyone who adds fuel to the fire that they lit themselves. In this case, I'm referring, of course, to the National Front, which obviously exploits, or tries to exploit, the emotions aroused by events. This, in the words of the very newspapers and talk shows that startled the whole business by writing the headlines in the first place, and by rehashing events endlessly at the beginning of every evening news program. The media then appear virtuous and humane for denouncing the racist moves of the very figure, Le Pen, they helped create, and to whom they continue to offer his most effective instruments of manipulation. Entry Fee and Exit Duty I'd now like to say a few words about the relations between esotericism and elitism. This has been a problem since the 19th century. Mallarmé, for example, the very symbol of the esoteric, a pure writer, writing for a few people in language unintelligible to ordinary mortals, was concerned throughout his whole life with giving back what he had mastered through his work as a poet. If the media today had existed in full force at the time, he would have wondered, Shall I appear on TV? How can I reconcile the exigency of purity inherent in scientific and intellectual work which necessarily leads to esotericism, with the democratic interest in making these achievements available to the greatest number. Earlier, I pointed out two effects of television. On the one hand, it lowers the entry fee in a certain number of fields, philosophical, juridical, and so on. It can designate a sociologist, writer, or philosopher people who haven't paid their dues from the viewpoint of the internal definition of the profession. On the other hand, television has the capacity to reach the greatest number of individuals. What I find difficult to justify is the fact that the extension of the audience is used to legitimate the lowering of the standards for entry into the field. People may object to this as elitism, a simple defense of the besieged citadel of big science and high culture, or even an attempt to close out ordinary people by trying to close off television to those who with their honoraria and showy lifestyles, claim to be representatives of ordinary men and women on the pretext that they can be understood by these people and will get high audience ratings. In fact, I am defending the conditions necessary for the production and diffusion of the highest human creations. To escape the twin traps of elitism and demagogy, we must work to maintain, even to raise the requirements for the right of entry, the entry fee, into the fields of production. I have said that this is what I want for sociology, a field that suffers from the fact that the entry fee is too low, and we must reinforce the duty to get out, to share what we have found, while at the same time improving the conditions and the means for doing so. Someone is always ready to brandish the threat of leveling, a recurrent theme of reactionary thought found, for one example, in the work of Heidegger, Leveling can in fact come from the intrusion of media demands into the fields of cultural production. It is essential to defend both the inherent esotericism of all cutting-edge research and the necessity of de-esotericizing the esoteric. We must struggle to achieve both these goals under good conditions. In other words, we have to defend the conditions of production necessary for the progress of the universal while working to generalize the conditions of access to that universality. The more complex an idea, because it has been produced in an autonomous world, the more difficult it is to present to the larger world. To overcome this difficulty, producers in their little citadels have to learn how to get out and fight collectively for optimum conditions of diffusion, and for ownership of the relevant means of diffusion. This struggle has to take place as well with teachers, with unions, voluntary associations, and so on so that those on the receiving end receive an education aimed at raising their level of reception. The founders of the French Republic in the late 19th century used to say something that is forgotten all too often. 
The goal of teaching is not only the reading, writing, and arithmetic needed to make a good worker. The goal of education is to offer the means of becoming a good citizen, of putting individuals in a position to understand the law, to understand and to defend their rights, to set up unions. We must work to universalize the conditions of access to the universal. The audience rating system can and should be contested in the name of democracy. This appears paradoxical because those who defend audience ratings claim that nothing is more democratic. This is a favorite argument of advertisers, which has been picked up by certain sociologists, not to mention essayists who've run out of ideas and are happy to turn any criticism of opinion polls and audience ratings into a criticism of universal suffrage. You must, they declare, leave people free to judge and to choose for themselves. All those elitist intellectual prejudices of yours make you turn your nose up at all this. The audience rating system is the sanction of the market and the economy, that is, of an external and purely market law. Submission to the requirements of this marketing instrument is the exact equivalent for culture of what poll-based demagogy is for politics. Enslaved by audience ratings, television imposes market pressures on the supposedly free and enlightened consumer. These pressures have nothing to do with the democratic expression of enlightened collective opinion or public rationality, despite what certain commentators would have us believe. The failure of critical thinkers and organizations charged with articulating the interests of dominated individuals to think clearly about this problem only reinforces the mechanisms I have described. End of On Television by Pierre Bordeaux, translated by Priscilla Parkhurst Ferguson, published in The New Press, 1998.